Hello everybody, good evening and welcome to the United Stands. I'm Mark Goldbridge and this is your latest Manchester United news on the United Stand. As we discuss chopper mooting talks, have Manchester United finally made a move for somebody in the January transfer window? We'll also be talking about the return of Anana. He may not even miss a game, he could be back mid this week to take his place in the FA Cup game next weekend. And also, what next, what next for Manchester United? Omar Barada is coming in as the CEO. A director of football is going to follow soon. What does this mean for Eric Ten Hag? A lot of people talking about it today. Is this the end of Ten Hag? Is this the start of a new era for Ten Hag? And how would that look? We'll also be talking about what will happen with the likes of Jaden Sancho, Mason Greenwood. Um, the big earners at the club. How does Barada fit in with his principles and Manchester United? Loads to get into, of course, as well as your conversation as well. So you're very welcome on this Sunday show. Call Jenny McGinley a prat because she's never right, says Kian. There you go, Jenny. Uh, that might be the other half there, Jenny. Um, there's arguments on a Sunday night there. Um, also got a bit of going to be gifting 10 memberships out for you as well. So get ready for those as well. Big shout out to the members. There'll be 10 new ones. So not, well, there might be more if other people join and gift, but uh, I'll be giving away 10 as well. Um, lots to get into. Let's start off with the chopper mooting talks. Let's start off with the topical stuff and then we'll get into the reflective stuff and the predictive stuff and the Ten Hag stuff. Um, I, in fact, let's just start off with, you know, this is what we do here. This is what we do. We're interactive. Um, where are you with Ten Hag? I should have done this before. Let me do this now. Where are you with Ten Hag? Ten Hag in, Ten Hag out. Get working on that while I give you the latest news. So, chopper muting. There are talks today apparently going on with Manchester United and chopper muting to bring him to Manchester United in this January transfer window. Fabrizio Romano has not said that. This is coming from other reports across Europe. However, Fabrizio Romano has said Bayern Munich want to keep Chopper moting. However, he would be open to a move to Manchester United and Manchester United, um, you know, like him. What we've been told tonight, and this is on the United Stand Twitter, and this is from a very, 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 very good source. And you can see it um, um, on uh, Sam's Twitter at C345. Sam. Uh, who is uh, um, uh, one of our uh, workers on the social media side of things. Um, we've been told tonight, contrary to reports, Manchester United, as it stands, are not in active negotiations with Bayern Munich for Eric Maxim Chupamuting. It's thought the player is liked and would be open to a move, but no discussions are currently ongoing. Now, you might be pleased with that. You might not be pleased with that. But in contrary to reports today that Manchester United are in talks with Chopper Mooting, this is not the case. And this is coming from people very close to who would be doing those talks. So it's not the case at the moment. Um, as Fabrizio has said before, he said it last Monday, we've got him on the show tomorrow as well. There is an admiration. There is a willingness from Chopper Mooting to come to Manchester United. But as of today, there are no active talks. And I think this feeds into Anthony Martial and what we've always been told, and what I said at the middle of last week, the next 10 days will be key. If Man United don't get anywhere with Martial, I don't think United will do anything with a striker. Um, whether you like that or not, we'll be using Martial and he'll be running down his contract. Uh, Chopper Mooting is a player that would like to come to Manchester United. Uh, Ten Hag has admired him for a while. He would be ridiculously short term. I don't mind us doing that deal, but... Would you rather have Martial for six months or would you rather have Chopper Mooting for six months? You always want a shiny new toy, but part of me is just like, I don't know. I just don't know about that. But look, breaking news, whatever you want to call it, we've been told in the last half an hour there are no active negotiations with Chopper Mooting to come to Manchester United at this moment in time. And I think that really is where we are at with, with Martial, um, who is obviously not, as our Dutt says, he's probably not going to leave. So there we go. Um, another bit of topical news before we get into this what next stage with uh, Barada and Ineos and, and, and Ten Hag and where he stands. Uh, member for month, uh, four months, Tahel, thank you very much. Uh, Rick, Rick, Rick Reed, biggest cash machine by Chris uh, Blackhurst. Yeah, I do want to read that, Jose. I've got to write this down. Chris Blackhurst. I've got to read it. I've got it. 
I just haven't read it. Um, I don't believe we should judge Ten Hag until he has everything the other managers have. He didn't choose uh, fee amounts. Judge once we have a CEO and a director of football, says Shane. We're going to talk about that literally uh, as our main topic tonight. But because there's a big thing to be said about Brian Brobby as well. He's got to stop that. And I'll tell you why he's going to have to stop that. And, and I said this a couple of weeks ago about Ten Hag. We say, will Ten Hag survive? Is his job in danger? We talk about all of that. But we've got to stop with the Brian Brobby shit. I know he scored a good goal today, but you know what? I've seen loads of, go loads of people score goals like that in the Eredivisie. Got to stop with all that. He's got to be told no. And I'll tell you for free what happens, right? Ten Hag says he wants Brian Brobby. Dan Ashworth and Barada say no. Ten Hag has to deal with that. Because what they do is they go, why do you want Brian Brobby, Eric? And he'll go... Um, you know, he understands, you know, link up play, he's quick, he's powerful, he can hold the ball up. Right, there's 10 players across Europe that we've scouted because we know our job who can do all of that and more. Take your pick. But you're not getting Brian Brobby because we're not just buying players from Ajax and the Eredivisie. And that's how it works. And that is something that Ten Hag is going to have to get used to. All this Brian Brobby, DeLitt, Anthony, Anana. I've had them before, I've played the game. All that is what Ten Hag is going to have to take on board. And it's about the word trust. It's about trust. You remember what we were saying this morning about Barada. Man City were looking at Jorginho. They said no, they waited, they got Rodri. They were looking at Harry Maguire. They decided no, the value wasn't there. They waited, they got Diaz. This is how a good CEO and a good director of football works. They don't dance to the tune of the manager. They listen to what the manager wants and they go, OK, you like a striker like Brian Brobby. Right. Here's, here's 10 options that are not Brian Brobby. And I'm telling you now, you're not having Brian Brobby because we're going to take one of these 10 options. And you can argue with us, but we know what we're doing. And we know that these players will be better value than Brobby, will be better players than Brobby in two years time and can do everything he can do and more. And that's how it works. That's the job of a director of football. And that is the job of a CEO. To say no to the manager, but listen to their needs and deliver a better option. And sometimes, you know, Ten Hag might say, I want Frankie de Jong. And he might be available for £40 million. And the director of football might go to the CEO and say, this is, this is actually a really good deal. You know, he's a fantastic player. It's a really good price. He's at the right age. There's a sell-on value or he'll be with us for five, six, seven years. It's a good deal. The manager's right. Let's go and do it. But they might go, no, we're not paying 80 million for De Jong. He's approaching his 30s. There is a player in Holland, actually, who is 21, who has the same attributes, who we can get for a quarter of the price, who is going to be a better player. That's who we want to go for. And that's how it works. Strong leadership above the manager. Um but look, I digress. Let's talk about Anana and then we can come back to this. Because the big thing is, we talk about Eric Ten Hag and we talk about whether he's in danger. And of course he is. But he's also in danger in relation to he currently has a veto. He currently has power. And if he doesn't want to give that up, then people forget. You know, it's almost like everyone sees Eric Ten Hag as Oliver from Oliver Twist. Who go, please, sir, can I have some more? What if he's going up yours? I don't want any more. You know, maybe Eric Ten Hag might go, I had power, you've taken it away from me, I'm not fucking listening. So there's a lot to play through here. Um, but I want to give you this topical stuff on, on Anana first. Gems is a, a legend of the chat. You'll know who Gems is. She's one of our moderators. She's just gifted five memberships. You're a legend. And uh, uh, Kirkland uh, has been a member for 10 months, four months. Thank you. Um, Ray Cowley says, the Anana story baffles me. Surely a player cannot go back and forth between the league and international football. Must break some sort of rules. Carol J has gifted five memberships as well. Make sure you shout out Carol and Gems. Um, and Rory C says, he's played less than six games minutes wise this season. Bayern don't want to keep him. They want to pretend to want him. So United pay a higher loan fee, says Rory, about chopper muting. Uh, Hopefully this is the start of something positive, says Paul Crampton. Let's hope so. This is Manchester United. Keep up the great content, Mark, says Paul. And I don't believe we should judge Ten Hag until he's everything. I've done that one from Shane Hughes as well. Right. Before we go back to Ten Hag and what's next and what Barada might do with Jaden Sancho, etc. Um, I want to say Andreas J has just gifted five memberships as well. And um, Nigel says, I've actually enjoyed watching, not watching Man United this past weekend, which is sad. Hopefully we can gain momentum as the season continues. Well, it all kicks off again from next week, doesn't it? Andreas J, you're an absolute legend as well. But um, 
I want us to say this about the Anana situation. Bienda may not play a minute for Man United this year. He might not play a minute for Manchester United this year. Um, if results go a certain way this week, Anana will be leaving the AFCON legitimately by the middle of the week and can start against Newport next Sunday, which would mean he's missed no games for Manchester United because he didn't go early to the AFCON and he will have played all the games. So, incredible. Incredible. Um, and therefore, if Anana is back for Newport County, I don't think Beinder plays a minute this season. I don't see how he plays. I mean, if you're not going to play him against Wigan and Newport, you're never going to play him in the latter rounds of the FA Cup or in the Premier League. So, Anana may, um, Beinder may not play. But I, I, I've said this before. I'll say it again. Um, Anana should be dropped for the Newport game. It shouldn't be about whether he's back. He should be dropped. Um, he seems to be immune to criticism at the moment and uh, he should be dropped. Um, incredible, incredible uh, goalkeeping against Spurs. And uh, as I say, uh, it was almost like he was on a tag to the goal line that he can't leave it. So um, on a curfew. So yeah, Bienda should be playing anyway, but uh, apparently Nana could be back for the game which I find incredible. Anyway, that's your topical stuff. Let's uh, let's 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 drive into this. Uh, a lot of people today have been talking about whether Ten Hag is going to be in danger with all these changes going on at Ineos. The poll has been running for a few minutes now. Where are you, the audience, the community with Ten Hag? 74% of you are Ten Hag in and 26% of you are Ten Hag out. And I'll tell you what, that, that fills me with a, a sense of enormous well-being because uh, obviously I'm Ten Hag in. I, I, I don't think sacking a manager is the way to go. In fact, I would say it right now, if Ineos sack Ten Hag, because it would be Ineos sacking Ten Hag now, it would not be the Glazers. So Jim and Ineos have control of the football side. If And, and have you ever thought of it like this? If Ten Hag gets sacked, it's Sir Jim Radcliffe sacking him. It's not the Glazers. It's not Edward Wood. It's not Richard Arnold. It is Sir Jim Radcliffe sacking the manager. And if he sacks the manager, he's no different to the Glazers and what they did to Van Hal, Mourinho, Oli, Moyes, Ranić. Exactly the same. So think of it like this. If you're Sir Jim Radcliffe and you're trying to sell a new future, do you want to be sacking a manager in the first few months? He doesn't want to be sacking a manager in the first few months because he knows if he sacks a manager, he's going to straight away have a lot of United fans going, well, the cycle starts again. You've let the players win again. You know, you've sacked a manager with, with an arm tied behind his back. And whether you're Ten Hag in or you're Ten Hag out, whether you're Mourinho in or Mourinho out, Oli in, Oli out, Ranić in, in Ranić out, the point is every one of those managers has always had at least one arm tied behind their back. So if Ineos come in and sack Ten Hag, whether you think it deserves it or not, we will know that we've sacked another manager because of player power and because he wasn't given everything he wanted by the club. And that's not the sort of thing that Ineos want. They don't want that. They want to be something new. They want to be, don't want to be doing what the Glazers did. They want to be doing what they want to do. So when these people say, when you people say, when I say, yes, Ten Hag's job's in danger, I think you've got to start from a point of there is absolutely no way Sir Jim Radcliffe or Ineos want to be sacking Eric Ten Hag this season. At least they want to get to the summer. So that's something to consider. What does the CEO mean for Ten Hag? Look, there's, there's one overriding thing here that you have to take into account. And we sort of touched on it with the Brobby thing. Ten Hag had a lot of power in taking this job. Veto on transfers. When you're the manager of Manchester United and you've got Richard Arnold or Ed Woodward as your CEO, they're bankers. They don't know football. You're in charge. You've got a lot of power. It's a lot of responsibility, but you've got a lot of power. You've got Blanc on the board, football man. You've got Barada as CEO, football man. You've got Dan Ashworth potentially coming in as sporting director, football man. And Paul Mitchell coming in as well, football man. You've suddenly gone from no idea to four ideas. And that, for Ten Hag, might not be comfortable. He might embrace it like a comf comfortable blanket and go, yes, security, we're all in it together. It could empower him. It could make him better. It should make him better. You know, the more competence he has around him, the better he can do at his job. 
I am a firm believer that, you know, when you want to succeed, you need people to challenge you. You need good people around you to challenge you, question you and, and make you better. And that could make Ten Hag better. But there is a flip side of the coin where Ten Hag goes, well, this isn't the job I signed up for. I, I, I had a veto. I had more power. And now you're taking it away from me. You're undermining me. You know, I don't think Jose, my point is, I don't think Jose Mourinho would react to this very well. If Jose Mourinho was Man United manager and he'd been given a veto on transfers and he was in charge and then suddenly all these people came in, I think Mourinho would be gone very, very quickly. And I think he'd find a way to go very, very quickly. Is Ten Hag the sort of guy that is going to take this external expertise coming in above him and embrace it? Or is he the sort of guy that's going to feel overwhelmed by it and undermined by it? And I think we must consider that. We must consider that because everybody's like, you know, Ten Hag's the victim and I sense he is and I feel he is. But he may also have his own, he might he might well have his own frustrations about this. And, and we must consider that. Um, I firmly believe that Ineos and Sir Jim will not want to sack Ten Hag until at least the summer. They will want to get through to the summer. And if they do part ways, they will want it to be more mutual, I think. I don't think they want to be attached to the word sack in their first few months because it's too reminiscent of the Glazer regime. But what did we say a couple of weeks ago? We must always, always keep our eye on the prize. And the fact is, Man United have lost nine Premier League games. Is it nine? What have we got next? Wolves away, West Ham at home, Villa away. That's our next three Premier League games. Do you fancy us not to lose any of them? We've still got to play Man City again, Arsenal again. We've got to go to Chelsea. We've got to play Liverpool again. You know, we've still got to go to Brighton. We've got some tough games to come. And there will not be an appetite to sack Ten Hag. And I think the FA Cup is going to be very, very important. The longer we stay in the FA Cup, the better for Ten Hag. But I said it and I'll say it again. He's got to be in the race for the FA Cup and top four in April. And what that means is technically in the race for top four and still in the FA Cup in April. After the international break in March, he might get away with it. But in April, he's got to be in the FA Cup and he's got to still technically be in a race for top four. Because the minute you technically can't get top four from points, well, Moyes got sacked for that. The minute you're out the FA Cup, you're very dependent on getting to sixth or seventh to be in Europe at all. So I would say, you know, there are people who want Ten Hag out. I don't agree with that, but I'm not going to deny it and say, oh, Barada, Ineos, Jim, they won't want to do anything till the summer and they won't. But of course, Ten Hag, I think I saw somebody today on the radio talking about, well, it's a clean sheet for Ten Hag now. You know, we can relax a little bit. He's got a clean sheet. This guy's from Man City. There was even talk that Man City a couple of years ago were very interested in Ten Hag as the eventual heir to Pep because they like the way Ten Hag worked. You know, he's been at Bayern Munich with Pep. Ajax style of football. I don't know whether this is true. I don't know whether this is true, but apparently Barada is a fan of Ten Hag and Man City were looking at Ten Hag. So you bring a guy like that in and you think, oh, maybe they do like Ten Hag. You know, I don't believe Ineos want to make a change at the moment. That's good for Ten Hag. But listening to somebody on the radio say, you know, it's like a fresh start for Ten Hag now. He can relax. It's not. Even as a fan, it's not. It's not a fresh start because we are in a we are in the midst of a very bad season. And it only takes another bad result. And and, and I think the look, he's on thin ice. I don't like to say it, but Eric Ten Hag is on thin ice. One more bad result, that's 10 losses. And people are going to be going, hmm. You know, you look at the league table, and I'll show it to you now. Um, I'll make it, you know, very, very simple for you. You look at that league table at the moment, and you're telling me he's got a fresh start. What about that makes you think he's got a fresh start? You know, we're three points off 10th. Wolves are playing as next in the league, and they're just behind in 11th. So precarious. He's in a precarious position. I look at the return of Martinez. I look at Casemiro. You look at Rashford. You look at Bruno. You look at Varane. You look at Maguire coming back as well. The depth. Luke Shaw. Results surely will improve. Um, I'm still hopeful we maybe can push really deep into the FA Cup. I'm still hopeful looking at that league table. 
I don't see us getting top five. I think I think eight points is going to be too much, but I see sixth. I maybe even see seventh, but it's going to be competitive. Um, and um, I think it'd be completely wrong to sit here and say, yeah, his job's safe. His job's safe. Like, he's going to get to the summer and that's when the real rebuild starts. I think there is, this is a hunch, I think there is a real desire from Sir Jim and Ineos and Barada and whoever comes in as the director of football to get to the summer to look at what happens with Sir Alex all those years ago and say, you can have a really shit season and not get sacked. Let's get everything right this summer and start again next season. That is something I sense could be an option. I still think there's a lot of people thinking they're going to limp to the summer and sack him. But I truly believe that actually, I think Ineos and Sir Jim and everybody would like to get to the summer, bring everybody together, almost go on a mini break, have a big old chat and say, let's start now. This is where it starts. Let's start doing some big stuff this summer. Let's start now. Let's be better next season than we were last season. And let's start the momentum of this rebuild. And I think they would like to do that. But it's whether Ten Hag can survive to the summer because he's on thin ice. And if he has a second half to the season, like the start to the season, I don't know whether he makes the summer because I think you get into a position where you do have to sack him. So give us your thoughts on that. Um, Sherlock Holmes says, every week with Ten Hag in, United are achieving a new low. Mark this tweet. All those with Ten Hag in will regret after the next four games for not letting him go sooner. I, I don't... I think I sort of said that in a nicer way than you, Sherlock Holmes. I want him to stay. A lot of people do want him to stay. If I, I... I don't want to fast forward to the summer. I want to get... I'd love it if we could finish sixth and win the FA Cup. I'd take that right now. And I know that's not what we're all about, but based on this season and that league table, if you give me sixth place and an FA Cup, that puts us into the Europa League. It gives us a trophy. It gives us a platform to start from. But whether he can achieve that, like you say, that if there's a few bad results, it could it could be gone. How much do you think Barada will help with selling players? Will he be able to move the dead weight the Glazers don't like to buy out? I'm going to talk about this United AV. Omar, Omar Barada oversaw 115 F, FP breaches. Is this not a concern, says Pete? Hopefully he's got wind. They're about to be charged and there's jump ship. Well, the Times says he hasn't. It's got nothing to do with that. So we can only go with what credible outlets are saying. And the Times are saying that Omar Barada has got nothing to do with those breaches at all. So um, let's be real here. New owners results in job losses 90% of the time. But Eric Ten Hag is underperforming at the same time. He's walking a tightrope until the summer. I think you're absolutely spot on, Akash. Absolutely spot on. Uh, last season was an anomaly. Ten Hag or Pep would be in the same situation when this team stick with this man. He will do well when supported, says Joe Palmer. Gems has just gifted another five memberships, by the way. Do you think Sancho will be sold in the summer, says Devils58 Red? Um, Donald Gordon and Necro, welcome to the members club. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to talk about Sancho. I'm going to talk about Barada in a moment because we are talking about what next for Manchester United, of course. Um, Jack Glancy says, off topic, but if I was the Cameroon manager, I wouldn't even put Anana on my bench after that pantomime he pulled to try and keep his spot as long as possible because he was terrified of losing it. Uh, Jack, with some very strong words then. Um, I'm very wary of... Oh, OK. Um, Joseph, thank you very much. Um, Hep says, Sir Alex seems to like Ten Hag and Ineos seems to bring Sir Alex more involved. So I think we should consider that. Yeah, just to close off on Ten Hag before we start talking about, you know, what's going to probably happen in the summer and how Barada is going to do, because I've got a big list of things here about Sancho, Greenwood, the high owners. Um, you don't get patience at Manchester United. One slip and it's over. Um, I think Sir Alex does like Ten Hag. And I think that they will listen to Sir Alex because he's highly respected. Um, and it's very, very clear that Ineos and Sir Jim respect Sir Alex. Um, you know, Sir Alex had some bad seasons. He did. But we do live in a different world where we've sacked a lot of managers. Um, if, if I could summarise the Ten Hag situation very briefly for you, I would say they want to keep him until the summer and have a big re-evaluation of what's going on. I think that's the plan. And I think they're determined to get to that situation. But we're living in a very competitive Premier League. And what we can't guarantee is that Ten Hag will get to the summer. Because 
we've not even mentioned player power tonight, really. Do they want to play for this manager? We'll have to wait and see. And also, even if they do, are they good enough to compete against better teams? Um, we're going to play some good teams between now and the summer. How many losses are we going to incur? 15, 14, 16, 12, 11, two more? You know, I don't know. So I think the plan is to get to the summer, but nobody can guarantee it's going to happen. And the scary thing is, if we did lose another four or five games, I think he's in massive trouble. And if he gets removed, what do we do next? Like, seriously, what do we do next? I mean, people get really excited about Barada. They get very excited about Dan Ashworth. They get very excited about Ineos. Would you get very excited about Graham Potter? And that's what I mean. You're one slip away from failure at Manchester United. And I'm not just talking about Ten Hag. I think Ten Hag is on a, you know, on a, on a tightrope, definitely. But you've also got to consider that Ineos, even Barada, Sir Jim, the new director of football, they're all going to be on a tightrope because the last 10 years have meant there is no patience at Manchester United. There is a there is um there is a momentum that can be you know bought upon and we can get behind, but there's not there's no time for any more big mistakes. You know we can't we can't employ another bad manager, we can't sign another bad player that you know is going to be here for the next six years. Every decision now has got to be right, and you're one bad decision away from being more of the same, and that's what they've got to avoid at all costs: more of the same. Which is why, you know, when people talk about Vinicius Junior, I'm, I'm laughing my head off. We're not going to do a deal like that anymore. It's over. We're not doing those Paul Pogba deals anymore because it's too similar to what we've done before. Um, do you think this all weakens player powers, says James? Well, I think it has to. Mojo is a legend. He's just gifted 20 memberships. I'm going to be doing mine in a moment. Unless we want to build a team like Ajax, Eric Ten Hag is the way. We want a Man United team. Eric Ten Hag needs to be out. Eric Ten Hag and world-class players won't do any good, says Alif. But I don't think we're signing world-class players anymore, mate. Um, I don't think we are. Um, look, in relation to Baraja and what I think he's got to do next, there are decisions to be made about Jaden Sancho and Mason Greenwood. Of course, there are. And that's always going to be um, at the forefront of some fans' minds uh, because, you know, some of those some some of you w would like to see th those, th those players back at Manchester United. Of course you would. Um, look, Jaden Sancho was signed for Manchester City from Watford in 2015. Barada was there when that happened. Uh, did he do that deal? I don't know. Does he like Jadon Sancho? I don't know. Um, is Jadon Sancho going to have a future at Manchester United? I don't know. And the same with Mason Greenwood. These are things that will be reassessed in the summer. But what I will say is, can't just leave it till the summer. I mean, if we're not going to be like the Glazers, then we've got to start making big decisions. I think that by April, you've got to know whether you're selling Sancho or you're keeping him. I think by April, you've got to know whether you're selling Greenwood or you're keeping him. You can't just go into the summer and go, let's wait and see what happens. The Bundesliga won't really finish till the end of May. La Liga won't finish till the end of May. Then everyone goes on holiday. Then it's the Euros. Then you're back in pre-season in July and there's not much time to sell them before the end of the window. You've got to go into a transfer window knowing what you... We've got to do something unique. We've got to go into, a... we've got to go into May knowing what we're doing. Going into May, Barada... And whoever the CEO is, and Ineos, have got to know what they're doing with Varane, what they're doing with Casemiro, what they're doing with Sancho, what they're doing with Greenwood, what they're doing with Maguire, what they're doing with wan what they're doing with Eriksen, what they're doing with McTominay. That's eight players. That's eight first-team players. Do you think we're going to get rid of eight players? Not a bloody chance. Not a chance. And there's more than that. So they've got to know what they're going to do with that. They have to know what they're going to do with that. Because if they don't, then... You know, we're going to be in a very similar situation. And this is something that Ineos do not want to be in. They don't want to be in a position where they're repeating the mistakes of the past. This summer transfer window has to be the summer transfer window that we've been asking for for the last six, seven years. Get rid of a load of players, bring some players in. And if you're going to remove Casemiro, Varane, Harry Maguire, I mean, straight away, you're talking not far off a million pounds a week in wages. What are you going to replace them with? Because best case scenario, we finish the season in the Europa League with the FA Cup. Best case scenario. You remove a load of players on big money. What are we doing next season then? 
Liverpool could be champions 20 times back in the Champions League. Arsenal could strengthen again and go and buy a really top striker. They've got a good team behind that. Man City aren't going to go anywhere. You know, they haven't even got the court case till next year. Newcastle, still going to be strong. A lot of money, still trying to build. Chelsea, you know, that's five clubs straight away. And we're not even talking about Villa and Spurs. So what are United doing next season? Europa League football, no Varane, no Casemiro, no Maguire. You know, are we better or are we worse? And, that, and that's what I mean. A CEO and a 25% ownership who takes over the football side, that's not going to bounce you into a title race. No, 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 sir. No, 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 missus. It's not. Of course it's not. It's, it's going to... It's all right saying... I see many people saying, get rid of Aram, get rid of Maguire, get rid of Casemiro, get rid of those big wages. You know, we can, you know, bring the wage bill down. And then I go, but what team are you picking next year then? Who's coming in? Who's coming in? And right, you're right. You go and replace, you replace Casemiro with some 30 million, 20 year old, 22 year old from Europe who's got similar traits. Yeah. You, you replace Varane and Maguire with Tadebo. Yeah. You go into the start of a new Premier League season. You've got Brighton away first game. Then you're at home to Forest. Then you've got Man City away. You've got three points from your first nine. What the fuck's going on? Yeah, this is a reality. So this is the this is the huge job that someone like Barada has got. This is the huge job that Sir Jim's got. And uh, the summer transfer window can't just be, let's get rid of Varane and Casemiro. We'll keep Maguire and McTominay because they're homegrown. We'll bring Tadebo in and we'll see how we go. It can't be that. It's either big change with a plan or don't bother. And, and you know, for me... Do you want to bring Jaden Sancho back into that environment? Not for me. Not for me. There's too many red flags. Let, let's move him off. Um, do you want to bring Mason Greenwood into that situation? Completely different to Sancho, let's be fair. But, you know, we, we, need, we need focus. We need professionalism. We need momentum. We need mentality. Huge job. Huge, huge job. Uh, bring the Manchester back to Manchester equals Omar Barada. Uh, we have nice people at the club, but not good enough for Man United. So Savish, except Ten Hag, all coaches, including McCarthy, Ramsey, should be evaporated. Eva I thought you said evaporated. That's a bit harsh. Evaluated and replaced. All players decline after joining. Bruno is an example. It's about time we had some fresh blood at board and director level. At least Barada isn't a jobs for the boys appointment. We need more. This is Emily Derry. And Rahul says, why is it that other, pundit, other, other pundits always say that you pedal negativity with the most recent one being the announcement about Barada? says Rahul. Um, jealousy, mate. Jealousy, um, probably. And uh, Mark, great show. If they do sack him, who will take over? That's good enough. I can't think of anyone good enough, says Tracy Taylor. And do you think all oh, this week... Well, just going back to what uh, um, uh, Rahul says. Look, if you're the biggest and you're the best, you're always going to get shot at. And that's what happens with the United Stand and our community. We're, we're all big enough to take that on our shoulders. It happens all the time. Um, where was my... Can, this is what frustrates me is people take a tweet out of context. Where was my negativity about Barada? There was absolutely none. I mean, I was literally saying last night and this morning, I don't care if he's at Man City. Like, I've actually... The thing I, the thing I struggle with is that you get called negative, right? I want a Ten Hag, a champion Ten Hag, and I still want him to stay. Is that negative? Um, I wanted a full sale and I wanted the Glazers out. We didn't get it. Is that negative? Uh, we appoint Barada out of the blue, from the blue. And all I said was, I just hope that he's got nothing to do with the 115 charges. Because you don't want a CEO that comes in, starts to do a good job, and then gets banned and sent to prison or whatever like that. Uh, the Times said he's got nothing to do with it. Uh, in relation to Barada, I've said it numerous times. I will repeat it again, though. Um, as I've said for the last five, six years... When it comes to the director of football and the CEO, we need somebody who is elite at what they do. And you go and get them from somebody in the game. You go and recruit the best. Obviously, it's not ideal. It's from Man City. But in a way, Man City are the best. They've just won the treble. They're dominating the Premier League. And we've just gone and bought the guy that was going to be their next CEO. So I don't know what's negative about that, really. I just think there's a lot of people who try and steal our audience by spreading lies and bullshit. And uh, it's not true. Um, and I don't talk about anybody else's audience or community because I don't watch it. 
So I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see why they spend all their time talking about us. But um, look, I think Barada is a is a very, very, very good signing. As I said this morning, it's clearly been driven by Ineos and Sir Jim. And from the Glazers' point of view, who own the football club, it's a win-win for them. If if Sir Jim does well and earns makes Man United successful, the value of the club goes up, the Glazers win. That's what it's all about. Uh, Stevens won his six, uh, his eight, uh, six aside game 8-1. Thanks for the great tactics. That hungover goalkeeper didn't cost you then. Uh, can't Omar start now versus the summer? Key decisions, says Jose. I mean, look, that's going to happen. That's going to happen. I mean, you, you can't... You can't not start working straight away on Manchester United. Of course, it's going to happen. I feel I need to gift my memberships because uh, Gems and Mojo and a few others have been gifting out memberships like their uh, Blue Peter badges. And uh, I feel like uh, I, I, I'm letting the side down a little bit here. So uh, let me just uh, get on with this and um, give you your free memberships as we take a little bit of a pause in the show. Um Here we go. So um, you should have five in the chat there. Get your badge in. And you should have another five coming in now as well. So there's 10 memberships from me as well. On the Sunday night show, which will always have a place in my heart because this is where the United stand started. Me, Kev, Martin, Rich, Alex... All those years ago, once a week on a Sunday night at eight o'clock, um, those were the days. And in what I mean, I, I look back on them with real affection because it always is like that when it starts, isn't it? Um, nice to see some badges in the chat, some new badges. Thank you very much for that. Uh, yeah. So look, I think that um, what next for Manchester United is a bumpy road, um, and you know. We can, we've got to be realistic. Um, as I said, if I could predict or ideally plan the next eight months through to the start of next season, as I said, somehow we stabilise and start winning games. And I think Casemiro and, Var and Varane and Martinez fitness-wise is huge for that. Luke Shaw as well. We've got to build from the back quite literally. And we need to have somebody in that midfield with the likes of Maynou and Bruno. Sherlock Holmes has just gifted 10 memberships as well. Legend. Um, so let's see if we can get 2,000 likes on the video tonight as well. There have been so many people whacking um, gifting memberships. Instead of putting a W, just smash the like button because they've, they've been fantastic. Let's get 2,000 likes for them. Show your appreciation. Um, whatever happened to Alex, Mark says Juan. Um, we still speak to Alex quite a lot. He's still in uh, one of our WhatsApp groups. Um, he's just based in Birmingham, so he'd be on a fan forum, but he, he lives in Birmingham. And we don't do the old stream yardy stuff anymore, so it's difficult to get him on. But yeah, we're still in contact with all the old crew. Rich messages me quite a lot, so yeah, still in contact with him. Obviously, Kev's here. Been here from the start. Legend. Uh, but yeah, I think that if we can get some momentum... Sixth place, win the FA Cup, might be pie in the sky, but I'd like that. And then the summer, realistically, if you're going to clear out, do clear out, but make sure you've got some to come in. I mean, I'm really hopeful that Paul Mitchell, and I would guarantee he has, I'm really hopeful that Paul Mitchell, who's not been in a job since the summer, has been doing a lot of watching the games of football. So I think Paul Mitchell's really important because... Dan Ashworth is in a job. Dan Ashworth's in a job at Newcastle. And Dan Ashworth is thinking about Newcastle right now. He's thinking about Newcastle for the now and for the summer. If you take Dan Ashworth out of Newcastle and bring him to Manchester United, what's the point in him going, oh, I've seen this player that suits Eddie Howe in Newcastle? So Dan Ashworth's useful. Very, very useful. But you bring him into the job... And he's starting completely fresh. You bring Paul Mitchell in, he probably knows his next job is going to be United or maybe Roma or whatever. But he'll be going round. He'll be scouting. He'll be doing stuff. And he will come to United with some players. And I think that's really important. Really important. 
We can't have everybody come in and go, I need six months to get my feet under the table because the summer transfer window will be written off. Be written off. If we, if everybody comes into United and goes, I need to assess the squad, I need to start looking around, we'll, we'll miss out on the summer transfer window. So I think Paul Mitchell is an interesting one because I'd expect him to come in with some players, ideas, etc. I'm sure Dan Ashworth will as well, but I think he's so locked in with Newcastle that why would he be thinking about players that are going to be suitable for Man United? Um, but yeah, look, my ideal summer, if we can get to the summer with Ten Hag, is that you can get rid of who you want, but let's make sure we've got better players coming in. If you get rid of McTominay, make sure you've got a better player coming in. If you get rid of Maguire and Varane, make sure you've got two better centre-backs coming in. And by better, I don't think you're going to bring many centre-backs better than Varane in. But somebody with the potential to be as good as Varane, who is ready to come into the team. That's what I mean by that. Um, I'd, say to, I'd say, to be honest with you, with positivity, you want it to start straight away. You want to start it tomorrow. But... I'd say next season's going to be a bumpy ride. Yeah. Um, I just can't see how you'd be able to change a lot in one summer. Um, and some might say it'd be better if we don't qualify for Europe, but it wouldn't. We need the money of Europe. So, yeah, and people would say, well, yeah, we. but if we don't play in Europe, we get to train all week. But I don't think that necessarily works. I mean, I watched Crystal Palace play Arsenal yesterday. They were crap. They've had, they've had a whole week off. Bournemouth today at home to Liverpool. Crap. They've had a whole week off. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be brilliant because you have a week off. Chelsea have had all week off till Christmas. They're mid-table. So I think we need to be in Europe. And um, I think next season will be a very difficult season. Um, I mean, I, I, I absolutely hate to say this. And this is what you've got to aspire to be. But I look at... I watched Liverpool today and... I don't know how Jurgen Klopp's done it. I don't know what how he's done it in one summer. How he's gone from a, you know, Zimmer Zimmer frame midfielder, Fabinho, Thiago and Henderson and not not much you can mix up. You know, it's the th that's the three midfielders to McAllister, Sabosley, Endo, Gakpo, um Curtis Jones, Harvey Elliott. There's another one I've forgotten, Gravenberg. You know, they've got that young lad Bjastic as well, who's not even fit. They've got like eight midfielders and they're not the finished article. They're not the finished article. They're still learning the trade and some of them might not make it. But they've got eight midfielders that they can just keep rotating. And I'm like, how has he done that? And then up front, you know, you can play Gakpo there. You've got Salah, you've got Diaz, you've got Jota, you've got Nunez. They've got five options there as well. Defensively, they've got a few options. And I think, you know what, that Liverpool team's still quite young. Arsenal are growing gradually by the season. Man City are Man City. So, yeah, I think it's um, United. You've got to make... The thing is, I think it's going to be a long journey. And we might not make it. But there's no negativity in that. Because it's almost like, well, if we can't do it, what's the point? But there's always a point. You've, you've got to climb the mountain. Yeah, other people might be ahead of you, but you've got to climb the mountain because you don't reach the top if you don't. And and what we're doing with this CEO and what we're going to do with the director of football is putting the right things in place. We were, I remember saying a year ago or maybe two years ago, I don't think we're at the bottom of the barrel yet. Let's hope we're at the bottom of the barrel today. Let's hope that the things that are happening are gradually climbing us out the barrel. Because I remember saying it, I can't remember when it was. It was when we, I think it was last January. And I said, I don't think we're at the bottom of the barrel yet. And uh, people were like, what do you mean? We're in a title race. We're, we're still in all these cups. And I just sensed that we might not be at the barrel yet because the Glazers are still here. I sense today we might have hit the bottom of the barrel. I think we might be climbing out of it. Um, but it could take a very, very long time. And even at our, even on our best day, it might not be enough. It might not be enough. Even if we start climbing, we've got no divine right to go back where we were. We haven't. And uh, it's going to be hard. But, you know, for once, I feel like there are things in place that could 
you know, get us there. The only one I, I see Eric keeping is the only way I'd say, sorry, Jevin says the only way I see Eric keeping his job is if the board told him to get rid of the big earners, which has clearly disrupted the club, says Jevin. And do you think the first team coaches don't get talked about or blamed as much as Ten Hag? Signing new players won't help until we stop their decline. I think this is a great point, Salvish. I'm going to come back to it. Nicholas Hardy says, I feel we are at least another 12 months away from seeing any of these decisions taking effect. It will take time. Welcome to Members Club QQQQQ. Whatever, whatever happened to Alex done that one? Um... Jack says, Sancho's back, Mark. He did a swan dive for a penalty and ran around for 60 minutes. Clearly, he's world class and Ten Hag was wrong. This is Jack, who has been sarcastic and has clarified that. Uh, yeah, I think this is a great point by Sarvesh. Um, Eric Ten Hag brought hardly any coaches with him. He inherited a lot of coaches. And if we're truly to make changes at Manchester United, we can't be blind to the fact that we need to be elite, not only in the boardroom, not only in recruitment, but in the coaching and the fitness department as well. We need to go and recruit the very, very best. Our set pieces are appalling. Um, our fitness is appalling. And this will be something that Ineos look at, 100%. I mean, Sir David Brailsford is from cycling. It's all about fine margins and fitness. So I expect to see big changes in there as well. Mark, you've got the biggest Man United channel in the world and everyone is going to come after you, especially those that are jealous of how successful you are. Cheers, says Franco. Thank you very much. And United AV says, how long do you think it takes for Barada to get the club to be a consistent title contender? Half a decade, says United AV. Oh, mate. I mean, I, I, you can answer that. What what do you all think in the chat? I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I, I will answer the question. Um... So tonight, we are a long way off fifth place, which is Spurs. We saw how good Spurs were at Old Trafford last week with some of their best players are. So I'd say we're a long way off Spurs and Villa, really, at the moment. Not for, And then you've got Liverpool, Arsenal and Man City on another level. Um, I think you could quite quickly close in on Villa and Spurs and get yourself into fourth. This is, this is not forgetting that Chelsea and Newcastle are under, underachieving and could move quicker than us you know we, we've got aspirations to catch up with Liverpool Arsenal and Man City but let's not forget Chelsea and Newcastle will want to as well in an, and in a way could be better equipped so we're in a very competitive Premier League um, I think in the next 18 months you could get yourselves back into the fourth place spot um, and then it's how long it takes to get where Liverpool and Arsenal are and then Man City you know five years you you you, you, you might be right what you've got to do, first of all, is, is build a team. And, and in fact, in the modern day squad that's capable of winning 75% of its games in the Premier League. You know, maybe you draw 15%, you lose 10%. Like 38 games in a season, if you lose 10 of them, 10% of them, that's four games. That's probably wins you the league, actually. So you've got to get to a point where you're winning 70, 75% of your games. And to do that, you need a squad capable of doing that. You need a squad that not only turns up for Liverpool away or Man City at home, but goes to Bournemouth away, goes to Brighton away, goes to Villa away and wins. We're miles off that, mentality-wise and quality-wise. So you ask me how long till we're title contenders. Well, title contenders don't always win the title. But a title contender is somebody that can win the title. And to be somebody that can win a title, you've got to put in a title winning... You've got to be in title winning form. I don't think we're anywhere near that. So from where we are now, I'd say squad wise, 12 players need to come in or step up from the youth or whatever. Um, 12 players, you're going to get some flops along the way because that always happens. 15, 16 players. How many transfer windows that? Three, four summer transfer windows. So you're probably right. Challenging for the title, I would probably agree with Immortal. Three to five years, but it doesn't start till the summer. So forget three to five years from now. Summer 24, 27, 28 season is the earliest, I think. Yeah. Uh, Paul, welcome to the Members Club. I'll tell you what, I'm loving all this chat tonight, by the way. Absolutely loving it. Don't forget to uh, tune in. Oh, and it won't be the 10 o'clock show tomorrow. I've got Fabrizio Romano at half one tomorrow. Um, I've got, I haven't got my notes with me. They're in the other room. Uh, you know, like last week, I was doing about 
Rasmus has only had 20 shots all season and Darwin Nunez has had 60. Um, and then we were talking about how many times United have been caught offside and long balls and the style of football. Um, I've done a bit on Anana that I want to bring in as well. So uh, we will do that uh, tomorrow at some point. I'm trying to think what the week is. Yeah, so uh, it's all starting to kick off with matches, isn't it, really? We've got Newport build up next week, latter part of next week. Um, and then we've got Wolves midweek. And then we've got West Ham at home. And then we've got Villa away. And then I nearly said European football's back, but we're not in it. We're not in it. Um, yeah, we've got a lot. Uh, Matthew says we're 25 years away. Mark, have you ever thought about the sad reality of older fans like Ricky who may never again get to see Man United lift another major trophy in their lifetime? I hope Sir Alex won't be a victim of this, is Mario G. Come on, you, you, put, you, can't, you can't kill Ricky off. Sunday night. We're not doing that. Bloody hell. United failure is always blown out of proportion, mainly by the media. The truth is, in the last five years, we've finished third twice and second. It's crap, though, Red Army. Come on, you don't believe that. You're the. Are you the one who always? Are you Maguire's brother? Are you the one who always talks about Maguire? Because I mean that's just ridiculous. It's not. Been, United's failure has not been blown out of proportion, mate. We've not had a good last five years. We're nowhere near where we need to be. Come on, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? But you know what? Going back to that Ricky comment, um, I'm not as old as Ricky, but I'm older than some of you, and. If Man United never win a title again, and I'm sure Ricky would agree with me, and I'm sure Sir Alex would agree with me, if Man United never win a title again, I'll be devastated. I will. In my lifetime. I'll be devastated. But I won't feel cheated, and I won't feel robbed. Because nobody will ever get, again, what we had in 99. Man City didn't really get that. We did. And we dominated for 20 years. Like every year, I knew we were going to fight for the title. And every year, we nearly won it. And there were years where we didn't. 95 was horrible when Blackburn did it. I hated it when Man City did it. There was 98 when Arsenal did it. But we were, we were contenders. We, we, we took it to the final day with Man City. We took it to the final day with uh, Blackburn. Um, and we, we were Arsenal's biggest, biggest contender in, the, in 98. So, look. Of course, I want to. I want Man United back because that's the standard we should set. But if we don't win the league again, I can't sit in. I can't sit here and cry and say I haven't had amazing times as a Manchester United fan. Um, that some will never, ever, ever get. So, um, yeah. Look, uh, I hope. I hope we are going to get back to those days. But uh, they were. They were very special. They were very special. And I think most of us sat there at times through that period and went. This won't last forever. And we might not ever see this again. Um, it, it was good. Um, the thing that always frustrates me about it was that, you know, people say it goes in cycles. And in a way it does. But it was so... Pre the thing that... I I've sat with people who are older than me and, you know, season ticket holders. And they've said, look, we've had our time. It's someone else's time. It goes in cycles. And I've almost stood up and walked away because I've gone, I don't accept it. And it's not because I'm a bad loser. I just don't accept it because our cycle broke by sabotage. It didn't break by a passing of the guard. Sir Alex Ferguson retired. We've never been a title contender since. I mean, when Sir Alex retired, they may as well have got JCBs in and just torn it all down. There should have been a momentum that we, we appointed the wrong manager. We made decision after decision badly. We spent a billion pounds and we may as well have thrown it on a bonfire. What pisses me off is, of course there was going to be a drop-off. He's the greatest sports manager there's ever been. But the drop-off should have been, you know, we win a title every five years. You know, we should still have been in the top four every year. We should still have been competing every year. We didn't just drop off a little bit. We fell off a fucking cliff. And that pisses me off because that's not a cycle. That's a sabotage. Like, how we fell after Sir Alex was ridiculous. You know, you could roll that dice and roll a different answer every bloody time and still be in a better position. It was just textbook how not to do it. Um, 
Ricky's the goat. He's got centuries left in him, says Jack. Exactly, exactly. Um, look, really enjoyed the show tonight. Hope you have as well. Well done to those who got memberships. Uh, we've gifted a few out tonight. Didn't quite hit the 2,000 likes. I think everybody who gifted uh, memberships deserved. There was plenty gifted out there tonight. And, uh, you know, make sure you smash a like on that video. Uh, big week ahead as we start looking forward to football being back. Uh, we've got Fabrizio on the show tomorrow as well. We're heading into the final week of the transfer window. We'll be asking whether United are going to get anything done or whether they're just going to sit back and do nothing. Um, we've also got, I think, developments that are going to keep coming forward in relation to the restructure of United. I think the director of football needs to be in tomorrow. You know, I wouldn't be surprised. There's not really any reason not to start moving. You know, Barada is in. Sir Jim's not official really yet. He's in. Let's get moving. Let's start. Let's let's start moving. The sooner we move, the sooner we can start doing things. Thanks everyone for watching. Love the show tonight. Make sure you take care and stay safe. And I'll speak to you in a bit.